Hey, Mommy Millionaires. I'm so excited to be here with my special guest today. And I know a ton of you guys are getting used to this YouTube channel, so I cannot thank you enough for coming over here and subscribing. And as you're watching the show today, comment, let us know what you're loving about it. Um, so my special guest today is a guy that I met actually at a gala in New York City just a couple months ago. And I was sitting there like listening to him have conversation and I talked with him a little bit. And then I found him on Instagram and I was like, oh my gosh, it's Todd Herman. I have his book in my office and I'm obsessed with this. He is the best-selling author of The Alter Ego Effect. Some of you guys may have already read it. If not, you need to get your hands on it like ASAP. But I was like a huge fan and I said, can you come on my show? And he was an instant yes, which made me respect him even more because he's so willing to give value to everyone around him. So you guys are going to absolutely love today's show. So welcome, Todd, to the podcast. That was one take, everybody. What you did, that, that was amazing, by the way. <laughs> but anyways, thank you. I'm excited. Yay. Yeah. Well, I, here's we, his book. We bonded at the event and we have the same sort of aspirations of, you know, helping good people do tough stuff. And so it's great to sit down and chat. I, and I've been like researching you ever since, like getting ready for this interview. Ask Patricia. I was like, I'm so excited because like your book is so helpful. Like there's a lot of self-help books out there, yeah. you know, and a lot of it says the same things, you know, it's like, yeah. think a different thought. Yeah. But this is something that if you read this, I mean, you're leaving and you know what to do differently to yeah. get different results in your life. Yeah. And you've coached thousands of people, like athletes, Olympians. I mean, yeah. who else? Like entertainers. Yeah, so public figures, leaders. A lot. I mean, I started in 97 working with young athletes, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds. That's all I was qualified to really work with. I was young too. But then, you know, eventually pretty quickly got into the ranks of pro athletes and then Olympians and then public figures and leaders and people in Hollywood and Broadway and, you know, all over the place. And the great thing is, is like, I try to live between the six inches of people's ears, like really try to figure out what, what dials I need to like twist and turn to kind of unlock performance for that person. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun work. I'm lucky. <laughs> well, okay. So I know it wasn't easy getting started, especially if you're like starting to work with 11 year olds, but why, why were you so interested in helping people increase their performance? Well, it was accidental. It was what, uh, so I grew up in, uh, I live in New York City now, but I grew up on a big farm and ranch in Western Canada and was an extroverted kid sort of in the middle of nowhere. And, a and now you sound like a Canadian. Yeah. I like didn't hear it until when you I said into the my, middle of nowhere. my motherland, <laughs> then I'm going to bust out some uh, boots and stuff like that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I was growing up in the middle of nowhere as an extrovert and I just, you know, you feel a little bit trapped because uh, I can't wait till I can go off to, you know, bigger cities or something. But sports was one of my great outlets and I was a really good athlete and managed to get some football scholarships and was a nationally ranked badminton player as well. What is badminton? Badminton's like, uh, is know, it the, is it like the basket thing more like a tennis? Yeah. So it's kind of like tennis. You got the net. And you've got a, uh, a small, we call it a birdie, but it's also named called a shuttlecock. And it's, uh, so you hit this thing across the net and it's, it's fun. Um, like racquetball, squash, all those games. That's but, awesome. Yeah, so you played on court. But anyways, I, uh, you know, I'm not a physically gifted person. I mean, I'm six feet, but I'm not 245 pounds playing football. But I played way bigger on the football field than my 157 pound frame when I was in high school uh, would lead you to believe. But the strength of my game was my mental game. Some of it was because I was the third boy. I had two older brothers who could beat the crap out of me all the time. So I played mental warfare with them. And, yeah. um, but I had developed this really good, solid um, sense of mental toughness. At what age? Uh, 15, 16, 17, 18. Why, how did you know to do that at that age? Because I feel like um, I remember because, kids in high school that were... Yeah, because I was playing in a volleyball tournament when I was in grade nine in the middle of Saskatchewan, small town called Golden Prairie, where this player on the other team, every time I would go up to block his uh, spike, he would flick his foot out and try to kick me in the cro groin and he did it <laughs> cro groin. yeah uh, the groin and so he did it a couple of times and I warned him I said listen do that again and you're you're gonna regret it and uh, he did it again and I reached through the net and I cold cocked him and knocked him on the floor oh my gosh. Um, and fighting and volleyball typically don't, don't go work. together yeah. so I got kicked out of the tournament and my my coach 
Uh, Grant Henderson was one of my first original mentors, like loved him dearly. And he pulled me aside and was just, you know, read me the right act because I was not representing our school well and, and stuff. But he said, listen, you got a lot of dreams and aspirations of going off and playing, you know, college sports. And you're probably going to realize them. But, you know, you know, players and coaches really don't like coaching you or playing with you. Uh, so you really need to work on your leadership, your personal leadership. And he gave me a book. Now, any good coach, you can le read someone the riot act and, you know, give them the honest, blunt truth. But you got to give some, get it, you got to give them the next step too. Right. Because the scold and how to integrate it. Yeah. Is nothing. So he gave me, he's like, you need to go, when we get back to school, you need to go to the library and get this book and read it. And then we're going to talk about it. So I did. I went and got the book the, a couple days later. And... And it was a book about sort of leadership and stuff. It wasn't actually a very good book, but in the book he did mention the mindset and sort of the mind. And I was like, oh, what's like that? Like the power of the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sort of sent me down this rabbit hole of learning more about it. Um, and I sort of just stumbled into all these different strategies and I, like, I was super curious about it. It's like, wow, like there's this world between the six inches of my ears. I don't know how to navigate it very well. Super emotional. And, um, yeah, just developed this ability to find the zone and flow state, which was what really allowed me to get all of my performance out of me. So fast forward to getting to the point where I started this, you know, practice that I had. When I left college, I, like any athlete that can't play their sport at a high level anymore, I went, like some, some of us do, they want to get back. I went to a high school where one of my former teammates was the head coach. Were you in the U.S. now? No, I was no, still, in still in Canada. Canada. Okay. Yeah, up in Edmonton, Alberta at the time. Oh, sorry. And, uh, and so I was working with the defensive backs on, you know, helping them. But I'd spend more time with them on their mental game stuff. I'm like, hey, So what would you find? Like, they're like, I want to be the best in this sport, but what was blocking them? Well, the big thing that you find is they can execute the stuff on the practice field or in practice or in simulation, but in a game, it's a completely different person that shows up oh and they're gosh. too nervous or they make mistakes or, you know, they're so concerned about what, how good the other team is or the other player is. And now they're out of their own head. I see that happen with my son, my nine year old. Oh my sure. Gosh. Yeah. And, um, and so I was like, listen, like you don't need to do any more cone drills. There's no more sprints that are going to help you with that. Like we need to help you with your preparation, your planning. We need to set some better goals for you. Like mm -hmm. here's some breathing strategies and all the stuff that I had used. Um, and these kids started getting really good results. And a good friend of mine in Canada is one of the top hockey trainers in the world. He invited me to come talk to his hockey academy. And he works Ooh. with tons of NHL guys. And I went and talked to these kids. And then people just started asking me, hey, can you mentor my son or daughter? And that's how it started. And when I said yes to this one person, they said, okay, well, how much do you want to charge? And I was just going to do it for free because I just like doing it. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know, $75 for three sessions. And that was my price for three years. Oh, my gosh. They were in-home visits as well. That were the, like an hour long. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes an hour and a half because I just, I just, you I stayed, I stayed until I was done. Until I could get that person, you know, to the next week, essentially, with some strategies. And uh, when I did my first taxes at the end of my first year, it worked out that I was making $8 and 56 cents an hour or something like that because gas money to drive to everyone's home and oh all my that. Gosh. And then the time that you miss out when you're so driving. So why'd you between... keep that going for three years? I loved it. You know, you just and didn't think to raise your prices. Yeah. I lacked the confidence probably too, as well. You, you haven't gotten that alter ego yet. Yeah. No, I did. Um, but not necessarily, I wasn't so concerned about making a bunch of money. I was concerned about sort of being the best at this. Like yeah, I said, it was my... Yeah, you wanted to see people get results. Yeah, and I thought that I needed to get more reps. Like, I needed to get more clients. And, you know, when you're that cheap, you're getting a ton of clients. So that was super helpful. And so in the end, yeah, it would have been maybe better to make some more money. But at what expense would I have had yeah. that in? And I wasn't a smart business person back then. I was really good as a practitioner. And then that, that, that's also what really helped me scale into working with pros and stuff as well. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're able to have that many clients, mm -hmm. you start to really see what's going on A below pattern. the surface, patterns. And, uh, and once I got into more elite people, this mm -hmm. alter ego stuff is, the, is this thing that's kept on popping up. It wasn't stuff that I worked with people on immediately. But I was like, wait a second, people come on bringing up this idea of a persona or an identity and everyone that keeps on bringing it up consistently performs higher than everyone else. There's something there because I used it and I should probably double tap on that and, yeah. and figure that out.
So. so you said in one of your interviews that I listened to that you hate the question, who are you? Yeah. Why is that? Well, because there's so many versions of ourselves. Like, which, 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 which you are you asking me, you know, who I am? Mm-hmm. So I, I But like, people get so caught up in that. Yeah, they do. You they know, like, they want to just like, I don't know who I am. And yeah. Yeah. And, and they suffer. Well, I, I say to people all the time and, you know, even the people that are watching, what's, what's the most difficult, if you've ever built a web page or website yeah. that is where you're at the center of it, what's the most difficult page on your website? The About You. The About You page, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. you're sitting there. Same thing in like, you know, putting together your CV or your resume. Yeah. One of those hard, difficult documents because you're sitting there going, but I'm way more than this one sheet of paper. Right. So it's always in context, though. You're kind of unpacking the who are you in the professional sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, like when you're creating your elbow page on the on the say the Internet, you're like, but how much of my how much of me do I share? I like, do know, I yeah. share? Do I put up the photos of me with my kids and my husband, or do I share that I like to play this on the weekend and that I'm a, you know, whatever it is. So, who are you is a bit of a trapping question for most people. Totally. Yeah, I hired somebody to do my about me page. I was yeah. like, I, I don't know what to say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so the the whole idea of you, you are a fluid conversation. So you, the meaning of you, is a fluid conversation depending on the context of where you are, who's asking it. Like if if you and I were at a a business networking event and someone said, uh, you know, oh, how are you doing? You're probably going to answer it in the sense of your business. Yeah, absolutely. But if if you're at, you know, a a a family gathering or a Bible study, family gathering, and your aunt says, oh, how are you? You're going to probably talk about it in the sense of your family. Totally. So I, I just, I throw that out there for people because I want people to start to like, really see that there's many, many sides of you. And that's okay. Yes. Mm. And it goes back to, I talk about in the book and I talk about when I'm on stages and talking to people that for the longest time, the psychology and spiritual traditions really talked about how anyone who operated as having a single self, having a single identity had the highest sort of uh, level of mental health. They had the lowest rates of anxiety and stress disorders, depression, and things like that. Um, and that people who had multiple selves or multiple identities, you know, had, had issues. Well, that didn't make sense to me because, you know, when I'm working with an athlete, who they are on the field and who they are off the field, two so different, different people. Yeah. Now, anyone that's met someone who's in the public eye and you go, oh, they're a lot different in real life than I thought they'd be. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, of course. And they should be that way. So then in about 2008, the psychology world flipped and said, oh no, we had multiple self theory, multiple selves. Those individuals have the highest, you know, quality mental health, lowest rates of depression, anxiety, and stress disorders. And people who try to be the same no matter where they go, they under index in life, mm. and they underperform, and they get trapped actually. And uh, and that's really what sort of the, some of the that's one of the core founding principles that I talk about in the alter ego effect is when you start to realize that there's many roles that you play in life. And that each role demands probably a different set of qualities and traits to help you be successful. And maybe, especially when you're pursuing new things like, you know, your world, like some people are really pursuing a new business or they're pursuing um, a new sales type role where resistance, rejection sits, concerns about what other people are thinking about you is like ready to grab you and pull you back onto the sidelines and you don't take action. That is a great area where you can tap into this naturally occurring concept that we've all used at some point in time in our Mm -hmm. lives, specifically when we're kids, when we put on the superhero costume, we pretend to see how far we can jump off of the couch or Mm -hmm. we're in the front driveway and I'm like, you know, I'm going to be LeBron James. And, you know, it's, it's us fundamentally asking the question of what could I do if I wasn't how I see myself now and I act through Kayla Mm -hmm. or I act through, because again, people are going to gloss over you know, you, and they're going to, oh, I just like the way that Kayla shows up or, and, and again, there's a lot of those traits that yeah, you bring you to this table to yeah. that are going to help that person. Yep. And so it's, so what it does is it suspends disbelief. It disassociates you from this identity that somehow is trapping you. I don't see myself as a salesperson. Mm-hmm. I'm not promotional. You know, I don't like getting rejected or resistance. And you start acting through this identity 
And now all of a sudden, all bets are off as to what is that person's capable of. Oh my god! Because you're not acting through your same beliefs mm -hmm. because your narrative has changed. You're yeah. acting through this. And I'm obviously in the book, I talk about so many different stories. And I know I love all this. the stories in the book and I love how you help people create mm -hmm. their alter ego too. Yeah. Like with all the different adjectives and stuff to describe. Because I think people, they get caught up in like, okay, I like the way that, you know, Todd shows up and yeah. how he speaks, but I don't know how to put my finger on exactly what it is that he's doing. Yes. Right? And so I help people unpack mm -hmm figure out, well, why is that? Like those people that you admire or respect or like, here's what I want to, you know, posit to people with that is it's really hard for someone to appreciate the qualities of someone else that they don't feel like they fundamentally don't have as well. Ooh, yeah. So you can't see something else and appreciate it if you also don't have it yourself. Mm. That's why the way that I work with people, and I would encourage people, whether you're a parent or whether you're a coach or a leader in your, in, on your team, is that when you start operating from the place of, they already have it. Like there's nothing about you that I, I never look at someone and say, oh, you're broken and I'm gonna fix that. It's like, no, you already got all the qualities and traits, abilities in you nested inside of you. Yes. They're just buried there underneath the weight of, you know, past trauma possibly. Mm -hmm. I talk about in the book, like the three hidden forces that actually stop most people yeah. from taking action or leading the lives that they want. Trauma is one of them. Some, some of us have just been through really tough stuff. You know, we've all experienced trauma. A car accident is a trauma possibly. Um, but then there's other forms of trauma, sexual abuse, you know, um, you know, bad parents that maybe abuse you or someone else. Like there's just difficult things that some people have walked through. Right. Um, I see it all the time with the women I work with. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's, that's, you know, we, we were talking a little bit before about kind of unpacking the origin story a little bit and truly why I got into the mental game stuff. It wasn't just the conversation with my coach. It was because, you know, um, I had one of those experiences. I was uh, a 12 year old kid growing up in the middle of nowhere and lo again, loved where I got to grow up. Phenomenal parents and uh, siblings. And being an extrovert, when summertime hit, I wanted to go away to every camp that was available. So church camps didn't matter. So one weekend I'd be Catholic, the next weekend I'd be evangelical, the next weekend I'd be Baptist, it didn't matter. I was gonna go so I could yeah, get around people. Get and uh, one of the camps that I went to, unfortunately I got singled out by two men and then over the course of two days got sexually abused and raped oh my and God. I'm, uh, you know, yeah, I'm so beaten up. Sorry. And so that obviously just crushes your world. Oh my God, and at so, 12 years old. Yeah, and I mean, then that caused me to really battle. I came home from that and the first thing that I did when I got out of the car was I dropped my bag off at the front door and I walked into the backyard. We just put a pool into our backyard on the farm and uh, went and changed into my bathing suit and tried to, uh, I jumped into the pool and tried to drown myself underneath the, uh, the, the ladder. Oh my God. And so that sort of started a string of, you know, quite a few different suicide attempts. Obviously I failed. Um, what, so did you tell your parents? No, I didn't tell anybody until just two and a half years ago. What? Yeah, I told my wife for the very first time. Oh and my even, God. And even when I told my wife for the first time, she had like this almost audible laugh because she was like, oh my God, now I understand you. Like now I get why some things can trigger you. Um, that wouldn't make any sense. <clears throat> so, but, and that was great because wow. then it actually got me to pursue the, the treatment that I actually needed so I could recover from, like yeah. to really let it go. And, and that was spawned from, I was, uh, we had just had our third, uh, our little guy, Charlie. Charlie, we were talking about our kids and yours is Charlotte and you call her Charlie. But uh, we just had Charlie in February of 2017. He'll be three right away here. And um, it was a very, very difficult childbirth. Like it wasn't, the birth plan didn't happen, had to be an emergency C-section. My wife lost, lost, lost a lot of blood and Charlie was coming out and he wasn't doing too well. So anyway, she had a, a pretty hard recovery and I was picking up Molly and Sophie. We live in New York City right next to this huge sporting complex called Chelsea Pierce and they go to preschool there or did go to preschool there. And I picked them up from preschool and uh, I put Sophie in the uh, carriage and then I picked up Molly to put her in and Molly, my oldest, uh, who was, you know, four and a bit at the time, she said, uh, she's just a really sweet kid, mm -hmm. really kind hearted. And as I put her in, she put her hand up to my, my cheek and she said, daddy, are you happy? And I said, yeah, I'm happy. Why? And she said, oh, you've been yelling at us a lot lately and it's making us sad. And I was like, oh. I'm in the middle of Chelsea Pierce 
tons of people streaming around me. And I just like, pff, just like yeah. waterfall. And uh, in that moment, I was like, I am not giving my kids secondhand trauma. Yeah. I'm not. And, uh, and so that's what really kind of wow. spurred me on to finally get rid of it. Because it always lurked below the surface. And then there's, you know, anytime some sort of maybe catastrophic thing would happen in your life, because it all happens to all of us, mm -hmm. it would just trigger those, that kind of, for me, it was a trapped emotion. Anytime I felt trapped, that's because that was the experience that I was going through when I was 12. Um, yeah, so that's, and then I, I went through and did uh, these different forms of uh, plant-based medicine therapy, which would have been absolutely, like, unbelievably. Like ayahuasca? I did MDMA therapy. So oh, I was involved okay. in the largest study at, in, at uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York City. I got into this study, and um, wow. that was transformative. Like, it totally got rid of all of the, you know, the... Um, the cluster of trauma that happens. Because what people don't understand about trauma is an event happens, and what happens when it's traumatic is you get this cortisol burst. Mm -hmm. So you get this chemical just explosion, and it fuses just disparate cells in your head. That's why if you were just leaving a, a convenience store, and you know the little bell above the door that yeah. will ring sometimes, and you get in your car, and then you drive a few blocks, and you get into a car accident, what happens is that cortisol burst that happens wires your electrical memory. So a lot of times your most recent sort of experiences. So now two years later, when you hear a bell go off, you feel this like you just this rage or this yeah. anger or this like just shock or this like, you know fight or flight response, right. and that's because that memory got fused in with um, that car accident. So what MDMA did was it just just sort of released all that, it allowed me to like really. Um, get a better view of that experience while I wouldn't wish it on other people. It's also what gave me my superpower because mm -hmm. that thing propelled me through the mental, like to pursue the mental toughness stuff. So I did it for just survival. Right. I needed it for me to survive. And then I got really good at helping other people with it. Yeah. And then one of the things that's helped me be very successful in my career is that have you ever met those people who like, they're a hammer and everything's a nail. Yes. So I've got that this, me. <laughs> yeah, I've got this one thing and it's going to work for everybody. Yeah. You know, everyone needs a funnel. Everyone needs a webinar or everyone mm -hmm. needs, you know, their own private group or a mastermind or like whatever it is in any field on the, in the, or discipline in so life. So one way to do something. Yeah. There's only one way. Uh, I was never that. I always played the more nuanced side of things. And, um, and it was because of that experience, I'm just, I've got a really I've got an extraordinarily high level of compassion for other people mm -hmm. because I know that some people are doing things um, and their actions that they have aren't coming from a place of they don't like me or, um, or even when I'm trying to get them to take action that they don't want success. It's that some people are just driven by some things that they can't even see. That's right. why I call it in the book, hidden forces. Personal trauma is sometimes a hidden force. You don't even know why you're doing yeah, it. Yeah, well, some trauma is even suppressed that your subconscious you mind remember. hides from you. Yeah, 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 because you don't have the emotional capacity mm -hmm. to deal with it, and your conscious mind knows that, so it keeps it locked away yeah. in a little door off to the side. So, um, yeah, so that's always been. Wow. I call it. I call it. You know, we all have, and I have it like all trademarked and stuff. And it'll be another book. You know that we all have capabilities. And what, Ooh, cape. Cape, oh, I love that. Cape, C-A-P-E, mm -hmm. like your super abilities. And a lot of times those capes are put on you in the darkest times. Yeah. Right? I believe that. Um, and everyone here that's, you know, you that's watching this, you've got that. Mm -hmm. And now it's about how willing are you to pursue it, to find it, to do the work that you need to do, to, whether it's for yourself or the, for, for the people around you, to really, like, find that thing and... and move towards it so mm -hmm. um so yeah so that's been that thank was, you for sharing that oh yeah of course yeah you you talk a lot about how you don't do therapy you say no. i am not the therapist no i am the performance guy i'm yeah. moving you forward yeah and i mean but there is a time for that therapy too like 100%. i mean it's like you need both yeah you need that person that's gonna unpack that's the hammer stuff. And nail example where like yeah. you know you meet some people who are like you know and again if you're a life coach that's great but don't think that your skills can solve all things. Don't right. do that. I do not have the skill set or even the patience more than anything to do therapy with people. However, 
in the context of the work I do, when you're poking around between the six inches of people's ears to help them perform, you find some wounds. Yep. And when I find them, I, my responsibility is to ensure that I surround myself with my other Avengers, my other superheroes that are phenomenal at tackling that thing. Yes. So I have, you know, a roster of amazing people that are great at, um, you know, basically experiences of trauma from child abuse. Mm -hmm. Other people are better at sexual abuse from when they're and or whatever it was for that person. Um, and, and now I'm going to direct that person over there. You go, you know, work with that person. Yeah. But what I know is we all don't have the luxury of stepping off onto the sidelines of life and getting perfect before we can go and exactly. continue to be a mom to our right. kids or pursue our entrepreneurial ambitions. And that's where I stay. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. We gotta keep your performance up while yeah. you still handle these other things. And that's where like something like an alter ego for me. And again, mm -hmm. what's I, your name of your alter ego? Depends on which one you're talking about. Herman. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> my, uh, well, my alter ego in business. So when I played football and when I played sports, it was Geronimo. Um, Geronimo. Okay. Geronimo was my alter ego there. And then when I played, or when I started my business, and again, like it was very, I was playing the whole game of referral. People were coming to yeah. me and that's great. I mean, we never want to turn off that faucet. Right. That's the best way. The best way. But it's hard to scale a business just on referrals. So now I was confronted with, well, I need to reach out and I need to, f I need to book my gigs. I need to like get my workshops mm -hmm. and get my speeches. And I had every single, I, you know, when my head would hit the pillow, couldn't wait for tomorrow because I was going to like really get after it. And then four o'clock in the afternoon, we hit the next day and, you know, didn't take the actions I needed to do. You know, I didn't hustle for me. And that eats you up. It doesn't take many weeks of that for it to, for you to feel, feel pretty terrible about oh, yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and then it was, I was watching an episode of Oprah, actually. This is where Super Richard was born. I was watching an episode of Oprah, it's in the book, and I saw, which was actually Oprah's favorite episode, where this lady, uh, Johnny Jock, had- Oh yeah, I remember reading this. Was, mm -hmm. was unpacking the story of how she was watching this uh, auction where Oprah was selling off a bunch of her clothing, and mm -hmm. the only thing that she could afford at the time was a pair of shoes. It's just that she's a size eight, and Oprah's a size like eleven. Um, <laughs> and so she bought a pair of shoes, and uh, she put them in the corner of her bedroom. And the, when things were dark, she'd get up and she'd go and stand in Oprah's shoes to get the you know the, the power to go and do the things that she needed to go do. Um, and when I was watching, that, I was like, oh my gosh, I used to use Geronimo. Why don't I build an alter ego to help me, in you know, in mm -hmm. business and he can be my advocate. That's how I thought of it is my alter ego is Todd's advocate. Yes. Yeah. He's Todd way. is really good at this mental game training and peak performance stuff, but he's not selling it. So super Richard said, I am going to sell Todd. Oh, just that bifurcation. I could do that in my head. My creative imagination was, you know, why was it super Richard? Uh, because Superman was one of my alter egos. Okay. Uh, so it was Superman, Benjamin Franklin, and one of my heroes, Joseph Campbell, composite of some of their attributes. And the um, reason also for, Richard's my first name. So Tom oh, is my middle name. Oh, okay. That name, yeah. like Super yeah, Richard. Super Richard, okay. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so I was like, I always thought that people who wore glasses were just smarter and more articulate. Like Martin Luther King. Yeah, well, I talk about it, yeah, in the book. Um, about Martin Luther King wearing fake glasses. So what I did was I was like, you know what? Because I want to show up in a more articulate way to get my message across so I'm not so clumsy with my words. So I went to Lens Crafters, which was a big you know, eyewear store mm -hmm. in West Edmonton Mall, and I bought a pair of non-prescription glasses, so fake glasses. Even the optometrist was giving me a rough time about it. Like, <laughs> that was, was before when, it was cool. Yeah, it was yeah, totally before it was cool. It's cool now. So I set the trend. <laughs> I was saying it. I set the trend. Um, yeah, and so when I would step into being super Richard, I'd put on those glasses. And what I was doing was I was activating really this tribe within my own mind. You know, Superman and Joseph Campbell and Benjamin Franklin. I was just borrowing their traits and imagining that they're with, they're with me so that I can pick up that call and have the you know, the courage to do those things. And, you know, Super Richard was like, you know, this dude over here, Todd, is, he's got good stuff. Mm -hmm. And he struggles with the resistance and the rejection, but I don't. I eat this up. Mm -hmm. Like, just give it to me more. I don't care 
what pain is on the other end that just I consume it I yeah. eat it and that's that was it and then six months later I, I just that. I just booked two workshops for myself and uh, hung up the phone and they were like really good deals and uh, I looked down and my, I didn't have my glasses on and uh, so and that's what happens with this is you you actively do it and then you're it becomes such a natural way that you show up in yeah. that context, that circumstance, that situation, that field of play, I say, in the book so often. And I was like, oh, I finally become what I wanted to become. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, where else? Where else? Where else am I under indexing that I can lean into and I can really start to... So that's where I know I've got this super strength is the power of my creative imagination. And my complete ability yeah. to reinvent myself constantly. Mm -hmm. And I'm not afraid of that. And why, why do people get so caught up in... Um not wanting to have fun and like be imaginative about this because that's really what it is it's like yeah we get to harness that inner child that like to be creative and yeah you know and people get start to judge it and think like well i shouldn't have to do that well there's something exactly. wrong with me well because kayla i'm an adult i should know better right right yeah and then they judge not, themselves that's yeah. childish mm -hmm. doing that stuff i mean come on that's how that's what we do like we take a look at the stuff that we did when we were children now again this, let's just look at this, not even from like a personal narrative standpoint. Let's look yeah. at this from like just science. Mm -hmm. So from the age of about six months, eight months to seven years of age, uh, every child is operating pretty exclusively in what's called the theta brainwave state, which is truly where creative play and imagination is just most alive. It's also when you take a look at our development of skills, attitudes, it's when we are just a sponge, just soaking up many, many things. Mm -hmm. Now, why are we developing skills so rapidly, developing new attitudes so rapidly? Um, well, some of it's because of the fact that our frontal lobe hasn't developed as much yet. It's not as overly active yet. And that's where reasoning, judgment, critical thinking skills the sit. The <laughs> overthinking stuff ends up coming in there. Um, and, but it's also because we're very playful. There is no sense of self yet. There's no awareness that, oh, I am an introvert, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We haven't put labels on ourselves right. yet. And if we have put labels on ourselves, it's because other people gave them to us. Yep. And then we adopted it. So like, you know, oh, I'm just emotional. My mom calls me emotional all the time or whatever it is. That's why like, we don't talk to our kids that way. I know. I tried not to either. Again, it's difficult. It's challenging. Yeah. So there's no, there's no beating up of people who do that because um, it takes a lot to it not. It does. It's to, like the discipline of that. Yeah. <laughs> but even if you do, you just say like you're acting X, Y, Z. So it's diff like you don't say, you know, for lack of, you're being a dick, you know. <laughs> You know, it would be like, stop acting like that. Yeah. You know, because acting, because that's behavioral. One is its identity. If I call you something, that's an identity thing. And that's a lot harder to change than if it was just a behavior thing. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So Great that's what's point. happening. Great point. So they're, they're operating in theta brainwave state. So then there's the other levels. There's delta, which is like deep restful sleep sits there. That's one of its forms. And then you've got above it, you've got alpha, and that's where kind of really great focus and concentration is at. And then you've got beta, which is like active, active um, mind. You're like, you're sort of judging some things, like you could be working through and concentrating. Uh, now, for me, I'm just like, okay, so wait, that's when you developed the most, is when you're in theta. Mm -hmm. You also play with your identity in that zone as well. Like your creative imagination is alive. Yeah. Your ability to be like, oh, I'm going to play nurse. Mom, you want to play nurse with me? Or I'm going to play, you know, bakery or whatever it is. Like mm -hmm. kids are doing that. And then we get a little bit older and our frontal lobe starts to kick in. And then and I, the switch would have happened with you as it, has, as it did for me. is like you look at someone who's like a couple years older and you just think that they're like the, the king or the yeah. coolest yeah. or whatever. <laughs> um, and, we, and we always like try to ladder up. And like, mm -hmm. oh, they do it that way. And what we don't have the ability to do when we're young is to recognize and see that the people that are above us, they don't know what they're doing either. Right. Uh, and then we go, oh, well, they seem like mom and dad just seem to be more serious. Apparently that's what you do when you're older. So I'm going to be more serious. Mm -hmm. Reality is the parents and the adults a lot of times don't, they're not steering right. the wheel. It's the little girl. They're in the being ruled by the puppet master of different things in their own mm -hmm. head too. So I just encourage people that what you see a young kid doing when you really observantly look at it, it is, it is literally the playbook for how you find 
higher levels of performance, mm. peak levels of performance, that playful attitude. Yeah. That's why in the book, I mean, you would have, that's why you brought it up. Consistently in the book, I'm like, when you continuously, like, when you see this as you being more playful, mm-hmm. you know, like, I'm naturally actually a fairly serious person. Yeah. Like, I'm a huge jokester. Um, I think I'm funny. My wife says I'm funny. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to go with that. Um, <laughs> but, like, you know, it'd be very easy for me to continuously flex that muscle of being serious. And so what this has done is it's kept me grounded into being more playful. And again, like I said before, this was also uh, a form of escape away from some of the, you know, the, the crap that was in my head, right? What, so what can adults do to start playing? Like to start like, you yeah. know, going Well, to, to start to, to kind of walk through like if there was five steps that people could start mm-hmm. using now. Um, uh, but get the book. Just get the book. I mean, they're getting yeah, the book. Just you're getting the book. Yeah. Um, uh, and and that is number one is always we build these things in context. We don't have one alter ego for all of our life because mm-hmm. that's now going to trap you. Mm-hmm. It's you know because someone says to me, Todd, how many alter egos going to have? And I'm like, how many egos do you have? How many egos do you have? You've got many. You've got Kayla, the ego as a mom. Yeah. Which sometimes that's the thing that can trap you. That's oh, why yeah. we use the alter ego because the alter ego is actually the best version of you. Yes. That's coming out. You're just inspired by the use of possibly someone or something else to help activate the best right. of you. Um, the so, Pinterest mom. Yeah. The alter ego. Yeah. <laughs> the Pinterest mom. So it's always uh, in context. So what I'd say is, you know, what's the area of your life right now that you're most frustrated by? Mm-hmm. What's the area that, of your life that you feel like you've got the most resistance in? Mm-hmm. Or what area of your life you're like, you know what, I don't want to go to those harder ones, maybe. Where do I want to be a little bit more playful and have a little bit of fun and sort of just, you know, retest drive this? Not test drive, because you already know, you've already done this. That's my favorite thing about this is, you know, I kind of liken this to, I'm sort of on this mission of this great awakening reawakening like reawakening these like because you were like that when you were a kid you were already yeah yeah you already know this yeah. i'm just giving you the really good method and process to really activate it in a holistic way yeah um, so that you're truly driving it and it's not being driven by outside forces like you're trying to because the moment you start to do this because you want to impress other people it's like our egos oh you're trapped yeah you're they're, this it's not is fun then this is coming from a place of truly this is how i want to be showing up mm-hmm. Other people can throw labels on me or pers- I don't care. This is how I'm going to show up um, in this space. So that's number one. That. What's the role okay. or the field to play? Number two is, okay, um, what, is it, uh, what is it about the way that you're currently showing up that you don't like? So just identify that. Is it because you're not even taking action? Mm-hmm. Is it because you're worried about what other people are thinking? Is it because you know, you're doubting your skills or something like that? Whatever those are, just unpack that. And then third is, well, what are the superpowers, the traits that you would want to be bringing onto that? Like, how would you most want to? That's one way of coming at it. The other way of coming at it is who already shows up, maybe not in that specific field, but who just inspires you? You know, like, like in, and it's Lady Gaga. It could be Lady Gaga. It could be, (laughs) um, it could be a character that has nothing to do with that role but it's right. like man i love princess leia yeah or or you talk about grandmas you yeah said people love their grandmas yeah the number one the number one category of alter egos is actually grandmothers wow and the reason is because we need to emotionally connect to this identity mm-hmm. that we have because mm-hmm. if we don't then you're going to robotically go through the process mm-hmm. and good luck with that because the unconscious mind is filled with nothing but emotion and um uh, just to give some people a visual, if you think about how we operate in the world, we operate in like very much a triune way. There's the mental self, um, there's the emotional self, and then there's the physical self. So we have, we, we have the ideas, we've got the knowledge, and that what I kind of submit to people is most of you already know what you should be doing yeah. or what you need to be doing right now. You don't have all of it. None of us have all the answers yet, but we know what we should be doing right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then we need to get, the, and then we need to take, have the behaviors to take action on that, yeah. but it has to walk across. So you got the idea, but it has to walk across the bridge of emotion between the six inches of our mm-hmm. ears and out onto the field of play of action. And it's most fun. people have the drawbridge up. That idea can't get out cause it's, it's hitting something. It's resistance. Resist- yeah. We don't know what it is. And so what I say is instead of me trying to go into the, your head and try and figure that out, I would much rather build a new bridge of connection. Build a new bridge. That's good. And that new bridge 
is the connection that we have to this alter ego, this super identity, this new persona, this new identity, which isn't you being fake. Yeah. That's yes, you people honoring. People get caught up in that. Yeah. Yeah. That's you honoring that. No, I, because people know I've done this. Kayla, I've had over 17,000 hours working with people one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. That's a lot of hours. I know. That's not counting group stuff and stages. I was stages trying to break it up. I'm like, gosh. <laughs> that's a lot of time spent one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and what I know is the traits you already know exist within you. Mm -hmm. Now, are you willing to admit that to yourself and then allow them to be carried out for you out onto the field by Super Richard or by Lady Gaga? Because that's, you know, that's why Stephanie built Lady Gaga. Lady Ga she built out Lady Gaga to take the dreams that Stephanie had and get them out there mm -hmm. in a creative way. And she, she wanted to do it with confidence, with compassion for other people, and for, with compassion for herself. Those were the three traits that she was most activating as to who Lady Gaga was going to be about in the way that she showed up. You know, just like mine was about being confident, decisive, and articulate. All three things that if I went back to step two were the things I was struggling with. I was right. insecure, I was not articulate, and I had a lot of indecision. I wasn't taking the action I needed to be taking. Mm -hmm. So that those were the th so when you get to that third stage of what are the superpowers, they're typically the flip of whatever you're struggling yeah. with. Okay, so that's so we've kind of got maybe the, the superpowers, we've maybe got the, the source code of who we think we would maybe like to bring to that situation. Now we go into this next phase, which is now giving it form and substance. And what I mean by that is, People do not recognize the power of a uniform, the power of totems Ooh, yeah. and artifacts, mm -hmm. right? Like if you put on a Marine's uniform, like your it. shoulders are going back. Yeah, you're I'm feeling a, drill a little sergeant. bit, you're, you're feeling yeah. tougher, right? I've done that for a workshop. Yeah, just like, <laughs> you know, if I put on an apron, I'm gonna feel maybe a little bit more expressive. Like I, I, I had chef's training when I was younger, like you feel more, creative if you put on a chef's uniform um and so, so now you don't have to put on the full uniform itself but you can use small things like that are representations mm -hmm. of your source code and inspiration so whether it's a ring that's got ww for wonder woman on it or you've got the same bangles as come on i gotta get bonus points for knowing what bangles are <laughs> you're from i feel like you're from new york City. can we get a high five in the comments ladies <laughs> um uh, but like you know, whatever it is, it can be necklaces, it can be bracelets, it can be watches, it can be, you know, any form of many, many things. So there's something that you can wear. Mm -hmm. um, it can be something that uh, you have with you. I've got a client who has a pebble that he has in one pocket. And when he wants to activate that powerful leader for his, he's a very wealthy man in, in New York City, when he wants to truly honor the leader within that's good with people, because he built his entire career by basically being like a steam steamroll railroader over top of other people, an amazing trader. But once he built up his business, he was not a very good people person. Didn't yeah. lead people very well. And um, but he feels very deeply. He wants to really honor the memory of his family. Like so, he's kind of like me. We're both farm kids, and I'm I have reverence for my family name, and just the idea. So he has this pebble that he got from his family's Iowa farm and he keeps it in his left pocket. And when he's going to step into like a leadership conversation or present to the board or present to his team or something, he moves it from this pocket to this pocket. And that's when the leader self comes out for him. And that's him. When he's pulling that over, what he's doing is he's, is he's drawing into himself the same type of values and qualities that his mm. father and mother exhibited in their small farming community where they were revered for their... Um, ability to give back and just generously serve Compassion, and stuff. Compassion, probably. Oh, and, that's awesome. And so it's just another simple way. Because even in business, there's no just one entrepreneurial identity. We have many hats oh that gosh, we wear. And yeah. especially like for the stages of the people a lot, a lot of times you and I'll work with. When you're in the early stages of, I mean, you know what it's like. Yeah, you you're the chief salesperson. <laughs> you're, the, you're the marketer. You're the promoter. You're the operator. Yeah. You're the bookkeeper. You're all these things. And nine times out of ten, we're, we're terrible at wearing a bunch of those hats. Mm -hmm. Um, and then most people just go, oh, that I'm just not good at money. It's like, okay, well, the version of you that's showing up when dealing with money isn't good, but what if you were bringing a different version of yourself there? Mm -hmm. Just play with that idea. Yeah. So, um, so that's step four is really, now we want to bring some form and substance some into the physical, physical reminder. world. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, 
and I talk about some more nuances in there and I talk about like naming that alter ego oh, yeah. as well. And, and that's the fun, that's, that's where you really, I, that's I love That's why you have to get the book. You got it. Yeah. You got to get the naming right. <laughs> um, cause again, naming, naming something in our own heads, it's like, you know, when the baby comes out, if you, I don't know if you've had any friends and they haven't named their baby after like the first couple of days and everyone's like, what's the name? What's the name? Cause he's the baby girl or boy kind of doesn't exist until you give them the name. Right. Same thing with the alter ego. The alter ego doesn't really exist mm -hmm. until you have the totem and the artifact and you give it the name. Yeah. You know, so then you can talk to it too. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a real and it can talk back thing. to you. Mm -hmm. So if Todd started to show up with more insecurity, Super Richard could be like, hey, Todd, get to the sidelines. This phone, because this is back in the day when you actually had a physical phone. This is 97, <laughs> 98 gang. Um, you know, this is my field. You mm -hmm. step to the sidelines over here. Yeah, you get the field at the front of the stage where you're working with people or when you're, but not here. So, uh, and then the fifth stage is truly that activation of it, like you committing to it. And that's where we kind of talked about it already, but that's where you're truly honoring the spirit of the, the, the people, the animal or whatever you're using as your source code to show up that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll give people the example because uh, a lot of people have talked about, say, visualization skills. You got to be able to visualize, yeah. and they actually throw it out there as if it's easy. That's how I know that people haven't worked with people one on one because the skill of actively visualizing, which means actively creating in your own mind what you want to be doing, is actually quite challenging and difficult. So yeah, we use forethought every single day to like think about, you know, oh, I need to go to the grocery store. That's you visualizing. Yeah. That's forethought. Because you can get easily distracted. Yeah. So. Um, so just to kind of unpack for people. When Is that I, what you do, the mental movie theater? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so my mental movie theater, and I, and I teach people this and I train on it, is building that mental movie theater in your head. So what mine looked like when I was playing football um, and I was in high school and in a university and college was I would, um, I didn't have my football pads on yet. And I would, uh, when I had my pants on, I would uh, close my eyes. And I would go inside the mental movie theater and it was like a movie theater and I'd walk up to the door and I'd walk inside of it. And it was very much like an old classic, like red crushed velvet on the wall yeah. movie theater. And, uh, but on the other end of the room where the screen was, cause sometimes I'd just go in and sit down and I'd watch myself do things. I'd watch life play out or I'd watch my game play out or I would, um, uh, see myself do things as mm -hmm. the observer third person and then I'd get into it and I'd actually see myself on the field. So my movie theater would actually change as well. They had this shape shifting ability. But at the other end by the screen there was two doors on the side and through one door walked uh, Walter Payton and Ronnie Lott, two of my heroes in football, Walter Payton especially. And they started walking towards me and then through the other door walked these five Native American warriors. Um, where I grew up in Western Canada is rich with Native American history oh, okay. and, uh, and I'm, I'm just super sort of passionate about that, uh, that culture. So they walked into the door and they started walking towards me and uh, the leader of the Native American warriors had five trading cards in his hand. Next to me on my bench in reality were five trading cards as well. Three of, of Walter Payton and two of Ronnie Lott. Okay. Okay. So um, they would walk towards me and just as they were approaching, um, the leader, Geronimo, would hand me the five trading cards and I'd reach out with my hand to grab them. And as I grabbed them, um, as, I, as I was reaching out for them, Walter Payton would say to me, uh, take each of these cards as a representation of all of us out onto that field. And so then I would grab them and pull them towards me, but then Geronimo would tug them back. And that's where Walter Payton would lean in and say, but don't you for one second dishonor our memory and not show up out there like we would. Oh. And that's where like, that was like the anchoring mm -hmm. thing. It's like I'm going out there with all of you and I'm going to honor you with the way that I show up. Mm -hmm. Cause again, my Instagram, I'm a six foot, I was six foot, I was 156 pounds. I couldn't put on any weight. Like I just had a metabolism that I wish I still had. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then that's when, uh, that's when Geronimo would l release the cards and I'd have them. And then, I would grab them now next to me on the bench and I would put uh, one of Walter Payton's in my helmet. I'd stuff it in there because I wanted to think like him out there. I wanted to see the field like he would. And then I put uh, his other two inside of my thigh pads of my football pants because mm. I wanted to run like him out there. Mm. And then I took the other two of Ronnie Lott and I stuffed them into my shoulder pads because he was known as being this devastating defensive hitter. And I wanted to hit like him out there um, and attack like him out there. And then... 
Uh, so I put all my equipment on and then I put on my helmet. And before I would clip my chin strap, I'd just pause for a second and then I'd snap it. And sound is actually a really phenomenal triggering device that yeah, we use. Yeah, I wrote that down to, yeah, yeah. to so activate your alter ego. To sound is a great activator. And then that's when, the moment I'd snap it, that's when the tribe of, like the spirit of the five warriors would come within into my heart. And that's what I would take out of that field. I love so you that. thought, you, in the physical world, you thought you were coming at Todd, right. the skinny kid. You were coming at Geronimo. No, you're coming after a whole tribe yeah. that were there just hell-bent on destroying anything that got in their path. <laughs> and, um, and it allowed me to like play way above probably what some of my skill level was. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, all of it. Like when you work in the pro level and just elite levels of anything. It's all mental. It's mental. It's mindset. So, what, okay, so my son, Cooper, who's nine, yeah. is huge into hockey. And he's like, when he's out there, like on the, like whatever, the practice rinks or whatever, the yeah. coaches are like, he's the best kid out here. But when it comes to game time, I mean, he yeah, just... The other day he had a really good game because I told him if he got two goals, he'd get a pair of Yeezys. He got <laughs> one goal, but yeah, I was yeah. like, you got to get the two goals. Um, but what is that? Like, how do you help your kids? Because there's so many moms listening in right now that need to help them find their alter ego. So I've been helping Cooper do visualization and yeah. he can do it for a little bit and he can see himself, you know, being powerful, but I want to have him take this on yeah. and have him. Yeah. So what's great about Cooper's age is he's still close enough to that creative self that he had playing around with things. And, but he's in this gap eight, this gap age group where they can maybe sort of look at that child play stuff as being yeah. childish. No, no, no. Childlike is what we want having a childlike, childlike discovery mm -hmm. approach. And again, he's still in developmental mode. He's not in, he's not in competitive performance mode. It feels like that, but as a parent, I'm just telling you, it's a, that's, yeah. that's not what we wanna be um, trying to push on them. So one is encouraging them to say like, um, if you could go out there and take somebody else with you to perform with you, who would it be? He'd say Patrick King. So Patrick King. Great, super skilled. So it's like, okay, so what is it about Patrick Kane that you really like? And I wanna unpack, I wanna hear what those are. Okay. Me. And it's like, you know, it's so crazy that you see that in Patrick because that's, those are, those are literally the qualities that you're already developing, mm -hmm. all right? So, um, uh, and then I would try to find some sort of totem or artifact that he could have with him that he puts on. It's like, listen, and so whether it's you go online, you say, listen, so I got this, you know, old, I got this wristband of Patrick Kane's online and this is his, or whether it's just a line of clothing that he has yeah. or something else. Okay. Um, and bef you don't, you, you're not allowed to wear this anywhere, but when you're about to go on the ice or when you're going from locker room to this, because again, this is about isolating ourselves in the context of performances to the certain areas and fields of play. Like, mm -hmm. I have a pair of glasses and I still do. And now I just wear them for dress. And in some ways it's like brand as well because of you know what I'm known for. Oh yeah, it's on here. But um, I've had people who come to me like, oh, where are the glasses? And I was like, if you want the glasses, you have to be a paying client. <laughs> Seriously, but it's like, oh, yeah. because <laughs> even, yeah, no, 100%, because that those who, th those are the people who get the paying glasses. Ooh. Those those are the people who get the guy who shows up with those glasses, because I bring a certain different set Energy. of traits. Yeah. Same thing, like, when I go home to my kids. So, um, you know, like, I'm a challenger coach. Like, I'm, you know, you're working with ambitious, tough people, big personalities. Um, I've got to, I've got to have them crash on the rock of the prudential rock kind of thing. Like I've got to be the immovable force because they're around a lot of people who are yes people. Mm -hmm. And I need to set the tone from the start that, no, 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 you're coming to me for stuff. Yeah. You know, and I'm not, cause I don't use any of my, uh, you know, celebrity clientele or my pro athletes on any of my websites. That's just a part of That's, that's why I have this huge referability rate. Cause I am the one person in the sporting world. There's a couple of us who will never trade our clients names. They talk about it in the book, like in the, in the prologue, yeah. how you know I've changed clients' names in the book. But um, I don't know where I was going with that for a second. But we were talking about Cooper being nine. And yeah, yeah. So um, how he needs that thing when he goes out on the ice. Yeah. So, um, but so so with them, I need to create that trust and safety with them, and in order for me to do the work that I do with them. So with um, with Cooper, but if you find so. We were talking about the artifact for him. Yeah. But when you find that thing, um, 
you're, you're trying to isolate it. Like it's only uses there. Oh, that's what I was gonna say was, so I'm a challenger personality type, but when I go home, my kids don't want the challenger dad. No, they no, want the loving. They want patient, fun, yeah. loving, playful person. Now all those qualities are within me, mm -hmm. but all day long, I'm flexing the muscle of the challenger. Right. And that's why I hear from a lot of people, man, I have a tough time turning it off. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's because you haven't identified yet who you want to show up as at home with your kids mm -hmm. or with your wife or yeah. husband, whatever. Now it's like, you know, like when I start giving people this language, this context, allows you to start to like really start to tap into our true superpower as human beings, mm -hmm. which is our ability to create. We are creators. We can create not only stuff outside of ourselves, we can create ourselves yes. and how we show up. So when I go through the door, I have a little hook on the, by the front door with a little bracelet that Molly made for me. It's got MSC on it. Um, Molly, Sophie, Charlie. No, it's it's got um, only love, which is um, uh, after that incident with Molly, where she put her hand up to my cheek, I immediately went home and I tore a piece of paper from my journal, my moleskin, and I wrote only love, uh. only love today. That's what it said, only love today. And I carried that in my back pocket and I was gonna continuously carry that in my back pocket, I still have it, it's in my bag, um, until I got through all the tra trauma treatment stuff. And um, only love and it's got my wife's name on it. So when I go through the door, I put it on and I stop. Before I snap it, I snap, before I snap it, I just, in my head, I'm imagining now my, my two heroes as being a dad with me and that's Mr. Rogers oh. and my own father. Hmm. And, and when I snap that, that's when they come into my mind. And when you think about, like we all act differently when someone's observing us. Absolutely. And yes. that's one of the powers of this mm -hmm. is when I'm going through being a dad now to my kids, um, I imagine that, you know, my two mentors are now watching me as I'm in there. And if I were to act counter to how I want to be showing up, now that's me dishonoring who they are and the brace that has to come off. And now it becomes a really powerful triggering thing where wow. it's like whenever I catch myself falling out of alignment with how I want to show up, I mm -hmm. take it off. And it's a reset button. Then I put it back on and I snap it and I go back, just get back at it. And it was like, you talk about, I mean, the, the great thing about this whole process is, and there's obviously a lot of meat on this bone type oh of thing. Gosh. And when people hear it, they're like, holy cow, I didn't know that you could do this. And I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm actually employing a lot of the psychological phenomena that already exist inside of every human being. And I'm just packaging it inside of a full system. That's why for you, like when you said earlier about like when you read a lot of self-help stuff, it's just regurgitated stuff. And truly it's because most people are not practitioners. You know, they, they, their heart is in a good place. They want to inspire yeah. people, but they haven't done the work. Mm -hmm. And so that means they lack nuance. They lack sort of the sinew of experience that's there. Um, so for, for getting back to Connor then, is that thing that he has only, he's only allowed to bring Patrick Kane out onto the ice for him. And, but the key part of that process, Kayla, is for you to be able to reflect back to him that you see those qualities in him already. And because again, like I said, he can only recognize that he likes Patrick Kane because he sees that somehow in himself, he might say, cause I want to play like that. And you say, no, but that's, that's actually a lot of, you've already got, you're already developing those traits. Mm -hmm. So now for, if he was here, I'd be like, uh, now, now Connor, when you go out there, that's you and Patrick Kane playing. And so if you hear me cheering for you, mm -hmm. what name do you want me to give you? Is it, is it Connor Kane? Cooper, Cooper Kane. Or sorry, Cooper, sorry, yeah. sorry. Is it Cooper Kane? Cooper Kane. Is that your, is that your Ooh, alter ego's name? Oh, yeah. Which is a he, good one. He would probably get excited. Yeah, is it Cooper <laughs> Kane? Because that's, because that's how I'm going to treat you. Okay. You're Cooper Kane. And then the fun part about this is, is there any way that you want me to show up for you as mom or dad on the sidelines? Because then I'll have my nickname too. So it's oh. Cooper Kane, and it's because again now you're building the Avengers type thing. Yeah. Right. The, so it's bifurcating the whole yeah. mom thing, and that's why like for a lot of parents that are coaches for their kids, I typically encourage the moms and the dads to make sure that they have a, a different name that they use with the like. No, you call me Coach whatever, and I'm inspired to act through the coaching style of Popovich or um, Bear Bryant, Bear Bryant or whoever. Yeah. So that they know that you're yeah. being playful with them because the best gift that you can be giving your kids is that, oh, like this is the normal thing to do because mom and dad still do it. Right. And so if mom and dad still do it, that means that me playing with my imagination is a very normal thing to do. It's and that's one thing. of the best things that you could do as a parent to them mm -hmm. or for them. 
So, so that's a place to start. Secondly, what I would say is, you know, it's, it's cool that you're rewarding him with the goals, uh, you know, having or scoring two goals, and, oh I'll, and I'll get you the Yeezys. Um, is, is it bad? Uh, well, <laughs> I knew you. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll encourage parents that, um, you know, if your husband uh, wasn't at the game or if you weren't at the game, the, the first question that typically parents will ask their kids when they come home from something is, hey, did you score any goals or did you win the game, right? Those are all outcomes. Mm-hmm. Now, outcomes are great because they direct attention, they focus, and we need them. Right. But if you focus solely on outcomes, you're going to be a highly stressed and anxious person. And it creates, it breeds a high level and degree of stress and anxiety because we don't have full control over outcomes, mm-hmm. right? Your son doesn't have full control over whether he actually scores goals or whether he can um, win the game. What's he, what he does have control over is the way that he shows up, mm-hmm. the attitude, or his um, his skills, okay? So if I was watching That's Cooper and, or Cooper Kane. Cooper Coops, Kane. <laughs> um, uh, if I was watching Cooper and, you know, we were in the backyard and we were practicing maybe a backhanded pass off of the boards, a bank pass or something. And I'd say uh, before into the game, because again, he's in developmental stages right now. He's nine. Um, I would say, make sure, hey, you've been practicing this. So make sure that you pract- you do it at least once in this game. Okay, try the bank pass. So if he finished the game and he did do the bank pass and he comes off, he's like, and they won the game and he scored two goals even. And he goes, Mom, did you see the goals? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that was great. But man, I'm so proud of you. That time that you were breaking out of the defensive zone and you banked the pass off the boards up to Tyler and then he took it into the zone. Yeah. I was so excited. You want to catch and applaud the process of things. Mm. Oh, I love that. Catch and applaud the, the process. process. So like, man, okay. when you were in the boards and you were digging around, man, you looked like the little Tasmanian devil in there. Like, those kids didn't look like they wanted to even go in there and fight with you. It's like, ah, oh, I love that. Like, your fight in there, you want to recognize, because he can control that. Right. He can control the fight he brings into the boards. Mm-hmm. He can control whether or not he practices things and then executes them in the actual game themselves. Yeah. So applauding that stuff is important. And if okay, he does score good. the goal, it's like, yeah, yeah, but do you know why? Like, did you see how that whole, it's because you got, remember your coaches talk about getting to the slot, crashing the net. And I know hockey well. I'm a, <laughs> Canadian. You got, you got to crash the net, right? And that's yeah. what you did. You crashed the net and then you gave yourself the opportunity to score. And again, just like in business, yeah. we just want to give ourselves as many opportunities. It's like the women that you lead. You're encouraging them to get themselves out there. Shoot the video. You have no idea the dominoes or the ripples that are being created by you shooting one video. And yet you're focused on the fact that you didn't get any likes or you didn't get any loves or hearts mm-hmm. or a bunch of people didn't comment. No, there are some people who consume social media and they don't like and comment. That's me. But I still saw it. And I was like, oh, I really liked what Kayla said there. Hmm. And then maybe you drop another one. And you drop another one. And it's like, you just, that, that third one comes at the right time based on the circumstances and situations of my day. And I'm like, I need to reach out to her and see if I can join up to her, you know, Millionaire S Academy. Mm-hmm. That's the right name, right? Millionaire S Society. Society. Okay. <laughs> the Academy Society. But like, so, and again, that's you, fo- that would be someone focusing on the outcomes. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Be the person who builds skills. Mm-hmm. And the skills that you build to be able to shoot videos, like, I mean, that's powerful. Or the, the sky the, is the limit with the, that. Yeah, because it translates into so many other areas. And, mm-hmm. the, and the skills are something that can never be taken away. Yes. From me. Like, yeah. I've been in business, I've, I've had two businesses where one embezzled all the money out of the company. Oh my and, gosh. And another one where I just came through, you know, a major lawsuit and it cost me millions of dollars. Um, and the one time before where they embezzled, like it sent me into, I, I should have actually, I mean, my, my accountant encouraged me to file for bankruptcy, but, uh, it was about five days after it all happened. And I was out for uh, a drink with a good friend of mine in New York is before I met my wife. Uh, and Mel said to me, Todd, if I was you, like, I would like, you lost everything. I would be like under the covers, head under a pillow, bawling my eyes out. And I said, yeah, I could do that. I mean, it's not like I don't feel shitty about it, but I haven't lost my skills. No one can take that from me. Right. Like, I know how to do this. And yeah, it sucks. I got to start from scratch again, but whatever. You know, that's just, you know, it makes that's me. That's such an empowering feeling, though, when you know you have the skills. Like, you, nobody. No. Like, yeah. You, you cannot get at me. Yeah. You can't mm-hmm. get at me because the core isn't lost. Yeah. So, and that's where, like, yes. you know, you owning that psychology in your own head mm-hmm. is so powerful. Like, that mindset, that toughness. And 
you know, there's so many people like, you know, and, and looking at like even your brand, like you, you've got such a beautiful brand, but what's behind the beautiful brand is you also do hard things and tough things. And so one of the things I encourage people, I just talked about this on stage a couple of days ago is, you know, the idea of journaling, you're, you know, your 2020 or your next oh, yeah. year, your goals or something. And so many people think about, oh yeah, I'd love to have like a nice glass of Pinot and sort of curl up on the couch with my alpaca blanket with the roaring fire going. And that, that vision sounds amazing, but in my head, that doesn't send a message to the words I'm putting on the page that they are in trouble. Like when I write out what my goal is, like it is in trouble because it's going to happen. Mm. And there are a lot of forces when you write out a goal that are going to start to take action towards that thing not happening. And what I'm doing is I'm inviting them towards me because all they're going to get is the sharp end of the spear. Oh you, my gosh. You are going to get slayed. Yes. There's just nothing. Now, you can maybe delay me, but over time, I am like water. I am consistent. I am not going to stop. Mm -hmm. And so instead, what I do in that situation, because a mentor of mine asked me to write out a bunch of questions. I was about 22 at the time. And it was about 40 degrees in Edmonton, Alberta, where I was living at the time. So if there's Canadians watching, it's about four degrees Celsius. And I took off my sweater and I went outside with my pad of paper and pen and I found the most uncomfortable boulder to sit on in the River Valley area of Edmonton. And that's where I answered my questions. And when I was writing up my questions where it was cold outside and my ass was sitting on top of a very, very sharp pointed part of the rock, I was sending a visceral message to me while I was writing that out, that I was like, I, I'm owning these intentions that I'm mm. writing out. Wow. I'm not sitting on a sofa with an alpaca blanket where there's nothing about the pursuit of anything that is comfortable. So I, wow. I, I made a switch that day where I wanted to pursue the most painful things that there were. Because behind pain, behind suffering, is just a version of someone that's very valuable. Right, because who's ever inspired by the story of someone who just got everything handed to them? Nobody. Like no movie was written about that right. person, right? Right. But when someone has everything going against them, um, and they still make it happen, fuck, I'm, that's a movie ticket I'm buying. Yeah, exactly. So. And everybody has that movie going for them. It, it, when you're All of in us it, do. when you're in it, it feels like God, this sucks. But like if you're watching from the outside at the end, yeah, it's no. like, Oh my gosh, it's so. See, and even dramatic, that, that's not amazing. my response. That's not my response. Sometimes I could slip into that for a second. I'm like, no, 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 no. Because something can't suck without it also being extraordinarily savory at the exact same time. Because mm. it's, there's something that's satiating something inside. Like there's a meat there that's there. So, you know, it's just the messages that I put out there. There's a lot of people who have like cotton candy. I call it cotton candy messaging. You know, it tastes sweet. Yeah. Sounds nice. Looks lovely. I serve up kale, meat, and potatoes. <laughs> like, well, it's the stuff that's actually going to change people's lives. 100%. You know? That's but my But I commitment. think that there's, a, there's room for everybody because some people at the beginning stages of change, they, aren't, they would turn you off. They'd be like, no, it's too, it might be too harsh for them yeah. because they're so... Yeah. I don't know. I don't even like to call people damaged, but they're sensitive, I guess you yeah. could say. But, and then that gets them kind of open to that world and then they'd be. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's all degrees of messages yeah. that need to be out there for yeah. sure. Um, uh, it's just at some point in time, you gotta hear the this. switch has to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, like for, even for coaching and training people, it's, I love to talk to, okay, what's your degree and level of honesty and truthfulness that you're willing to be with me? Because if you're not a level 10, I can't work with you. You also said something like if they haven't put in a thousand hours of like work or practice, they, they don't get to work with you. Um, the context, the context around that is if I'm trying to help someone on the business side, build up an expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I'm not someone, I'm not someone in. who's going to invent someone into an expert. Like I have like, even on the, the business training side of our company, like we've, I've got a whole playbook of models and frameworks for how you build out um, a true thought leadership type practice or an influencer, mm -hmm. um, uh, like in that training world, uh, coaching or consulting space. And yeah, I'm not going to invent someone. Like you got to go do the work. Like I'm a, I'm such a huge believer in apprenticeship, and it's so lost nowadays because everyone wants success now, or they want the perception of success right now. And I'm like, man, you talk about a recipe for you know imposter syndrome or insecurities. That's a, that's a pretty strong one. Whereas going and tucking yourself underneath the wing of someone who's at the level that you want, 
And that's where the decision to only seek out the best. Mm -hmm. You need to recognize in yourself and you need to, the moment you see yourself as you are someone who's only worthy of the best, the best of information, the best of coaching, the best of nurturing, all that kind of stuff. Man, like that's when you finally have connected to a deep sense of appreciation for who and what you are and what you're gonna stand for. And so for me, um, even though I had some, you know, terrible psychology at times around my own self-worth because of that stuff that happened, yeah. um, I never ever stopped listening to that inner voice inside that was given to me by my mom when when I was leaving the farm and she said, you know, you know, they're, they're farmers and ranchers and they know that world very well and they knew that I was going to probably pursue things that were outside of the realm of their competencies and yeah. skills, but they gave me phenomenal you know, the real foundational traits of character and integrity, things that are like most valuable. Right. Um, and they said, you know, you know, we're probably not gonna be able to help you with like advice on that kind of stuff, but you know, just never forget that whatever you go and pursue, find whoever's the best and go and tuck yourself underneath their wing. Wow. That was amazing advice. Yeah. Just be around the best. Cause that's really what yep. my father and my mother were. They were well known as being the best. I mean, it sounds crazy to some people that there's the, there's the best farmer. A hundred percent there is. And that was my dad and my, and my mom running that place. And so that's why I pursued Harvey Dorfman, who is, you know, he's the giant of the mental game industry. He's known as the Yoda of baseball. He wrote the book. He wrote literally the Bible of mental toughness and uh, tucked myself under his wing and many so others. So what about for those people listening in that they know they need a mentor in yeah. order to, you know, go to that next level, but they don't have the moolah to, yeah. you know, work with somebody. What would you tell them? There are, there are other forms of trade that are there. So even Harvey... I was about three years, it was 2000, beginning of 2000, end of 2000 when I reached out to him and I went and saw him at the beginning of 2001, uh, but he didn't know me and I reached out to him and said, listen, I've been doing this for about two and a half years, three years now, um, and I've been working with these young athletes, but I really want to, I really want to be the best at this and I've read a bunch of different books and they don't really sound like, it, like I've played at a pretty good level, but some of these sports psych people, it's it's a lot of psychological theory. It's not practical advice. Yours is the only stuff that makes sense to me. So I reached out and said, you know, I'd like to come down and help you out. You're probably, you know, you're probably running an individual practice and there's probably another book in you. Can I come and just organize stuff, do administrative tasks, wow. clean things up, take yeah, things you off your plate so that you can do the thing that you need to do, which is write another book. Cause I would love to see another book from you. And he ended up responding back and we got on the phone and uh, he was like, his first question was, you don't think you're going to live with me, kid, do you? And I was like, no, I'm not gonna, I, I, I've got an aunt and uncle who live in the area. I'll stay with them, which was a lie. They, they, there was no aunt and uncle. Uh, and so we chatted on the phone. And he's like, well, what are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to just take stuff off your plate that should, you shouldn't have to be dealing with. And I'll organize stuff. And Because I'm guessing, based on your personality, you're probably a fairly disorganized uh, person. And kind of was. But um, So I went down to North Carolina, where he lived at the time. And I spent uh, 33 days with him straight. And I lived at a Motel 6 just down the road for $28 and just or $28.50 oh a night. Oh my gosh. And I had no money because uh, I wasn't making very much. And I put it all on my Scotia Bank credit card that, um, yeah, I definitely maxed out. But, uh, <laughs> but on the eighth day, Roger Clemens, who is you know, one of the greatest baseball players to ever live, came down to see him and then Andy Pettit and all these like superstars over the course of eight days and, and Harvey let me sit on on every single one of the sessions. Wow. So here I am seeing and witnessing the best mental game guy on the planet working with the greatest athletes in that sport and I sit there and go, oh, all my perceptions of what that type of athlete is struggling with is completely wrong. And I got to see what their real challenges were, which were more off the field stuff that would impact their play on the field. And, you know, that would have taken me a decade to figure out mm -hmm. if I got lucky even. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, and I got to see just how he really, he didn't coddle anybody. He was very much, he swore like a trucker, uh, as well, but he just challenged them. He's like, you know, um, anyway, so then when I left because he was so busy and he's so revered in baseball and he's only got so much time he started funneling new people to me because wow. people reach out and say hey you know roger says you're the guy and he'd be like listen i got no time but there's a young guy that i'm working with and he would say he's better than me um 
And so if you want to connect with him, and so, and he said that because of course that person's context is, I want to work with Harvey Dorfman. Right. And now if he said, oh, I'm going to pass you off to Chopped Liver, dude, you know, because right. that perception of that person They'll is be like, I'll just wait on the list. Because I'm not Chopped Liver. Right. So, uh, so yeah, that was great. And then my reciprocal, wow, that is so, cool. so my reciprocal nature of that was anytime I had people reach out to me for like media interviews or whatever, I would say like, you know what, this is actually something better that Harvey, my mentor could answer for you. And so I would do that for Harvey. And, you know, there's always some sort of symbiotic relationship that was there. There was never any competition at all because there's so much to go around. Um, so, so yeah, so, you know, maybe someone can't pay to be in someone's mentorship, but they can volunteer at an event. They mm-hmm. can, cause that's, a, I, I've got people who reach out and say, Hey, you know, I'd love to come and volunteer. Yeah. I had somebody like beg me. He was like calling me for weeks and weeks wanting to come and work at my event. And I was like, what does this guy want? Like that guys don't <laughs> yeah, that's, come into my circle, you yeah. know? And, and he like did it. He was relentless and I let him come and he was just like, you know, basically helping out with chairs and like doing all these things. And at my event, I had like a, a sickness that came over me yeah. and he got to go on the stage for 15 minutes so I could like get with, um, get my, like, yeah, get yourself meeting. together. Yeah. 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 And he like, everybody was like, that was like one of the highlights of the event. Oh, so, that's awesome. I know. It's so yeah. cool. But he was relentless in like saying, how can I help you? Yeah. You and, know? and, and so that's actually a mistake that people make though too, Ooh. is when you reach out. Cause it happens to me a lot. Cause obviously I talk about this. People ask me, people know, like I am, I, I love honoring the fact that I am a massive product of standing on the shoulders of many more, in some ways, better people or mentors and yeah. advisors and stuff. And I love giving them praise and saying their names and, and stuff. And so people know that and they reach out and don't do, don't make me do work. Don't say, Hey, how can I help? Tell me exactly. Tell me what your skills are. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you're good at. And how that could impact, you know, like what that, what that can impact. So it's like, Hey Todd, maybe you heard me talk about a current project that I'm working on. You know, one of them is like, listen, I'm scaling up alter ego as much as I possibly can. Or I've got some studies that we're going to be doing with like NYU and the effects of alter egos and using them with kids going through cancer treatment. Yeah. Um, uh, because that would really help them with most likely, uh, the PTSD that typically happens after cancer. It's one of the most non talked about things is when someone is finally done with their cancer treatment, you know, support family, people stop asking you a lot of support in the very beginning when you get diagnosed, a lot of support, maybe when you're going through it, but afterwards nothing. Yeah. And yet, the rates of clinical depression of people that have come out of cancer treatment is extraordinarily high. Your fatigue levels are so low. You're, you're, you're so fatigued because your body has just gone through tremendous right. amounts of treatment. Um, and if I could make an impact there where someone is now, it's Batman that's getting the treatment because mm-hmm. you got Batman's outfit on or costume on. And that might unshackle some of these kids from their identity being attached uh, to the experience. So what made you think about doing that? Oh, it's always what I've wanted to do with it. And, uh, and so I knew when the book came out that I was going to pursue that with, wow. with, with people because there's been some other st- studies on that specifically haven't been done, but just based on other types of studies that have been done on, you know, alter egos or the, the shaping or just other, other principles that I talk about in the book, mm-hmm. the hypothesis and the thesis would be that it would really affect that. And yeah. uh, because I want to show people just the power of how it can be used in many, many different mm-hmm. ways. Same thing with soldiers in the military, highest rates of depression, suicide, domestic violence, divorce rates amongst mm-hmm. any profession, them and the police officers. Why? They have a uniform. Right. And you're told about what it means to wear that uniform. You know, the motto, the credo of what that is, the history of that uniform or whatever. But when you go home, you might physically take off the uniform, but you don't mentally take it off. Yep. And all of a sudden you're acting through, just like I was talking about the challenger Todd. Yes. Now you're just acting through those traits and that's not the best set of circumstances for a family to thrive no, in. No, absolutely right? not. And, uh, and so, you know, I wanted, I'm just sort of in the final phases of getting a, a study approved with the U.S. military that we can use to help build super soldiers. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Super soldiers in the field, but then also, you know, super parents at home or super dads or super moms and, and stuff. Oh, so yeah. they can really see um, themselves as more than just one identity. You're not just mm-hmm. a soldier. It's the multiple selves. That You're many attending. selves. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, let's direct that. Okay. So last question I have to ask you because you're here yeah. in Newport beach and we just had this horrible tragedy yeah. happen just yeah. a couple days ago. 
And I think about, you know, the alter ego with Kobe Bryant yeah. and the Black Mamba. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were talking before this interview started about mm -hmm. how it's just so sad here. Yeah. And because of everything that Kobe and, you know, the area yeah. and, you know, people's, yeah. And the Mamba mentality that yeah. people talk about. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, him and then like Sasha Fierce and Beyonce would be like. Lady Gaga. Yeah, yeah. Lady Gaga. But, you know, what, I know you were going to maybe like talk a little bit about Kobe and mm -hmm. what he's done for the world. And Well, he, them. he's just, he's a, he's a tremendous force um, because of his just unbridled commitment to just excellence. Mm -hmm. Like that's where, like I felt like when, when, when he passed away and again, a lot of tragedies happened that day with other people, but totally, if we're yeah. talking specifically about Kobe, you know, I felt like, like maybe there's a, there's a rip in the fabric of, you know, excellence that happened there because there's few people that had his just, just dogged determination and commitment to being excellent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and his ability to also reinvent and recreate himself. Like that's a good example like with, 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 uh, the Mamba thing, you know, he created the Mamba, the black Mamba, because he was going through that, um, sexual assault trial that mm -hmm. happened. Right. Yeah. So again, he's a complicated, he's a complicated person. Like we all are. Uh, but he felt like this is, this is where the black Mamba was born was that he felt like he was losing his identity. Right. So again, tracking this to other people, are there some times in your life where you could, you felt like you were sort of losing yourself in some way. Totally. I've Sometimes it's before. in a positive way. Yeah. Like, you know, you be, you get married, right. And there's a new, like, there's, yeah. there's the husband wife thing. It's like, Oh, like some people have a tough time adjusting to that mm -hmm. because your identity is being, it's a new you yeah. now. Um, and that happens when people become moms. Too. Mo oh, 100%. And so he was watching Kill Bill and the the movie and he saw the black mama come on and he's like wait a second that's what i'm going to take out onto the court mm -hmm. um and then he did the next step which i talk about in what i was talking about in uh the step number steps. three mm -hmm. step number three of like once you find what you think might be your source code get to know it because it's like any serialized fiction thing like you know people came to you you know, they came to you and they saw something of yours or someone might have mentioned you. And so they look at you and they, so they're getting a, a bit of a surface level understanding of you. Then they start consuming more of your content, hearing more about your story. And they're like, oh, I really like her. I resonate with her. I see myself in her. Now they're getting more deeply connected to you, right? Now they're connected to you emotionally, right? I talk about the whole mental, emotional, and physical self. The drawbridge is now lowering. So for him, he learned more about what the Black Mamba was all about. And the more he learned about it, the more he saw himself in it, which then created the greater likelihood that he could actually adopt that when he went yeah. out there. So, you know, um, but just just him as a, I, I, just, I was really excited to see where he was going to be taking things yeah. and his, you know, just so it's such a terrible um you know, loss because of what his, and not and just, but Gianna as well and what, that was, what he was doing there. So, uh, but again, a good example of this is why it's so powerful to pursue tough stuff because right. the legacy that you can leave behind mm -hmm. by pursuing these things. And, and there's no denying that he's left this, you know, indelible impact on people. Yeah. I yeah. know just in the grocery store. And down the way, they had Kobe balloons and flowers because he would go into that yeah. one all the time. Yeah. And people said he was so nice. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it is. It's about the legacy you leave. That's why you have to go through the painful stuff and the uncomfortable path. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because it's not easy. Yeah. But anyway. it's worth it. All right. So last question. Okay. What is the most shameless thing you've done to build your business? Shameless? Yeah. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Um... Oh, that's a funny one. I've never been asked that way. Uh, I don't know if it's sh so. I'll I'll tell you, the very first time I spent money, so I was always referral, but the first time I spent money on actively trying to get people to come towards me, so like okay. paying for advertising yeah. type of thing, um, I uh, wanted to break into the NHL, so National Hockey League. Yeah, oh, I know. And I made a <laughs> now I made a list of and I had all the teams. Um, but I knew that part of probably me seeing some of those teams, if I ever got a call would be the cost of travel and I could I sort of mapped it out. I could pretty much only afford to travel to the Western conference teams. 
So I went to Canadian Tire in Canada, which is like the Walmart of Canada, and I bought 16 hockey pucks. And I brought them home and I bought a hacksaw and I cut every single hockey puck in half. So now I had 32 hockey pucks. And I wrote up a letter uh, to send out to every GM, general manager and coach, head coach of every single hockey team in the Western Conference. Um, and I had cement glue and I took half of the hockey puck and I put glue on it and I had a spot on my letter that was available in the upper right hand corner and I glued it on there. And it was basically like, you know, I think my little sub headline said, just like you can't play a hockey game with half a hockey puck, you can't develop an elite player with just physical skills Ooh. or physical training. Yeah. You, you need the mental game. Mental game. So I, sent, I mailed that out and I uh, used like overnight delivery with like FedEx. In total, it cost me uh, $989.11 to send it out. And I had about $1,100 at the time. <laughs> uh, so you went all in on this. I went all in, mailed it out. And then, you know, waited for my like conf confirmation emails that they were delivered, 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 delivered. And then I waited a day, nobody called. So the next morning I resolved, I'm gonna start calling all of these people. Mm -hmm. So I very first phone call I made was to the Vancouver Canucks. And uh, uh, Dave Nonis was the GM there. And I called the office and I said, uh, hi, is Dave in? And the lady answered, she said, uh, yeah, he is. Uh, can, I let him, can I let him know who's calling? And in that moment, I was like, wait, you can just call the general manager of a sports team and you can get put right through? This is amazing. Why didn't I do this before? Stupid Todd. And uh, she's like, can I let him know who's calling? And I said, yeah, uh, just tell him that Todd Herman's on the line. I sent him a letter yesterday. And she's like, oh, you're the half hockey puck guy. Oh. And she's like, hey, and she, I could hear you. She's like, hey, Dave, I got the half hockey puck guy on line. Or no, she's like, I got Todd Herman on line. He's like, hey, send through the half hockey puck guy. Oh so uh, puts me on the phone and I talk to Dave and he puts me on the speakerphone. There's a couple other coaches in the room. He's like, we were just laughing about your letter. And then I'm, I was like, I was devastated because I thought, oh no, now I'm a joke to these people. Yeah. And he's like, loved it. That's the best thing anyone's ever sent me to like get our attention. He's like, you're 100% right. You know, you totally need, in order to get the complete player, you have to work on the mental game. Thing is though, we are already working with Saul Miller. So Saul is the number one hockey sort of mindset coach in, in the world phenomenal guy and uh and he's like uh, so we have him on staff but there's some players who don't necessarily resonate with Saul's strategies so why don't I connect you with his with their agents and then maybe you can work with some of them so he connected me with three agents and those three agents were the first people to start funneling me a bunch of clients wow. and so that was it was so my shameless thing was me <laughs> cutting hockey pucks in half and sending them out to people I love what yeah. a great story. Yeah, thanks. You got to be willing to do like, I mean, it may seem silly, but it totally worked. I mean, it made you stand out. 100%. You yeah. Know? It was a good com conversation starter for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So was that the only one you got out of that? No, no, no. I, I, I continued to call other people and, you know, some people, there was no response. Some people, you know, they responded like a week later, but it got my name out there. That, that was the key them. thing. Yeah. It, it, it created a bit of a brand mm -hmm. identity because then I could go to people at, conferences or like at some of the events and introduce myself and I say I don't know did you ever get a half of a hockey puck and people would go you're the guy so cool well yay thank you so much for being on the podcast today Absolutely. I learned so much I wish I could have a pen and be like writing notes so I'm gonna make sure to watch this back at least 10 times because there's so much goodness out of this so um to recap you guys we had Todd Herman from the Alter Ego Effect on the podcast today. And I want you guys to pick up this book because it's actually, I feel like it's almost a workbook for you guys to go through. And it's something you can look back on constantly when you're looking on taking on a new identity for yourself. Can, um, I, can I stop yes. you with one thing? Okay, I'm, I'm getting up from the couch here because okay. there's one other thing I want to share with everybody. Okay, oh my gosh, she's in action mode. And that is, I've got a kid's book that's coming out. Oh my gosh, how and, cool. And it's and this is the one that so it's called My Super Me. And, oh my god. And it's all about finding the courage for tough stuff. And it's it's about basically the story of how a little kid is finding their own little alter ego. I am obsessed. So I'm um, This is uh, so cool. So when does it come out? It comes out next week. So whenever I mean I'm sure Oh, this is this is happening, yes. Oh, okay. We're so, gonna link it. So yes. Febru February fifth is when this comes okay. out. Okay, and, and we're gonna get it everywhere? 
they can get it everywhere. All right, yeah. it's happening. Your mom and millionaire people are gonna step up. Step up. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. I was just saying last night, I was at Barnes and Noble trying to get the kids a new book. Yeah. And there's nothing good out there that has, I mean, it's all like girl drama. And I'm like, oh my uh -huh. gosh, I told my daughter, I was like, we need to write a book. Now yeah. Todd wrote the book. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God you guys have to pick up these books. We'll make sure to link everything below for you. And just to recap, something that stood out mainly to me is the five step process that you can go through at any time. You guys could teach this to your kids, you could teach mm -hmm. this to your friends, teach this to the people on your team. This could be an amazing just like session you guys could do um, during like your group yep. things that you do. So um, I want all of you guys to take that away. And I know for me, I'm really gonna start naming her because I feel like I have all these different yeah. people and these hats that I wear, but I don't have names for it. So that was one thing I'm, I kind of resisted. And I think it's just because I need to step into that creative role and say, okay, I'm gonna yeah. give her a name. And I know Cooper's gonna love the Cooper Kane thing, so thank you. You're welcome. Yay, if you guys loved this podcast, make sure to take a screenshot, share it out there on social media, tag Kayla Craft, Todd Herman, maybe we'll repost it, but that's one way you guys can fill our cup up is giving back to us and just telling us how did we help you today with the stories and the tips that Todd gave. So thank you guys, I love you.